You have my apologies in advance for the gratuitous quantities of very small writing on this slide. In this video, we're going to look at the linear variational method, which is a way to get at what the coefficients should be if we have some trial wave function uh, phi, which is a linear combination of a basis set, which consists of basis functions, which are just some trial wave function, and these parameters, these C of n, are going to be the variational parameters, which we will tweak to minimize the energy, get the lowest possible energy, and thus, according to the variational principle, the best possible wave function, given this type of functional form. So to derive what the energy and these coefficients should be, given any type of trial set of trial wave functions here, any basis set, we're going to use a two two basis function state. We have C1 times F1 plus C2 times F2 is our trial function here, uh, indicated in, in direct notation by these two kets here. And for the sake of this derivation, we're going to assume that the set of these coefficients are all real. In general, they can be complex, but it's going to make our derivation easier just to assume that they're real for now. Okay, so our expectation value for our energy is dictated by this equation here. We have the integral of, psi, of phi star times h acting on phi, the Hamiltonian acting on phi, that integrated over all of space, what, however many dimensions this wave function is in, and that's divided by this uh, phi star phi integrated over all space, which is going to give us the normalization and ensure that this gives us a normalized wave function. Okay, so for our numerator here, <coughs> We can expand out this integral in terms of our basis function, in terms of our uh, trial wave function phi, and that's c1 1 star plus c2 2 star h times c1 1 plus c2 2. Okay, so when we foil that out, that's going to give us four individual integrals here. So because h is a linear operator, we can do this type of separation. We get C1 squared, 1 star, H1 integrated over all space, and then the four similar terms for the other states here. 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2. Then we can use the shorthand for this integral here. So the integral for a general basis function I and basis function J of I star HJ integrated over all space is going to be called HIJ then that gives us this result we have down here. Just uh, straightforward going from this line to this line. Then we have the additional simplification that H12 is going to equal H21. This is true because the Hamiltonian and all quantum mechanical operators are going to be Hermitian operators. And if you go back to the video that describes the definition of what it means to be a Hermitian operator, we see that this is what it means to be a Hermitian operator, that this has to be true for these two integrals where we have these two general uh, functions here. So that allows us this simplification for going from this line to this line where H12 is equal to H21 so this H C1 C2 H12 plus C2 C1 H21 just becomes 2 times C1 C2 H12. So that leaves us with three terms here and these three terms are going to be what our numerator here in the energy expression is, this phi star h phi integral. Then for the denominator, we have phi star phi integrated over all space, and that's going to be similarly four terms here. You get 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, and 2, 2. Then we're going to similarly define a shortcut notation for these integrals here for a general integral i star j over all space, as we see here. We're going to call those sij, and those sij are going to be called overlap integrals. Overlap integrals are the, a measure of the extent to which these individual trial functions overlap with one another. If we had a set of orthonormal functions, then the overlap integrals would all be the Kronecker delta. They would be 1 if you have 1, 1, or 2, 2 and they would be 0 if you had 1, 2, or 2, 1. In general, we're not going to have orthonormality, so we're just going to derive this for the more general case from here. Okay, so then we get <coughs> this line here with the four overlap integrals that we talked about, and we can quickly see that S12 has to be equal to S21 because 
in this integral here, this I star J uh, is just going to be, this is going to be commutative. Multiplication is commutative. And again, we're assuming that these functions are going to be real for now. In general, they'll be complex, but the same equations we derive will still hold true. Okay, so then that gives us the simplification, the same simplification we had up here, that these two terms in the middle here combine to give us a 2C1, C2, S1, 2. So the final result is we get these three terms here, and these three terms constitute our denominator here, our normalization denominator. So then rewriting what we get for our expectation value of the energy, we can go over here, and we have those three terms from the top, and three terms from the bottom that we got from these uh, two places here. Now we're going to multiply by the denominator on both sides to get this equation in the brackets here. Then in order to minimize the energy according to the variational principle we want to differentiate with respect to those variational parameters the set of Cn. So if we do that with respect to C1 and set that equal to zero as we'll do down here uh, what we see is, in this case, for differentiating with respect to C1, we, we need to do the uh, product rule because the energy depends on C1 and all of these terms in here depend on C1. In this first term here, <coughs> you, go from, uh, you go from C1 squared S11 to 2C1 S11. In the second term, you go from 2C1 C2 S12 to 2 C2 S12. This final term does not depend on C1, so it goes away. And then for differentiating the energy, uh, you would just get the partial derivative of E with respect to C1. It's a partial derivative because the energy also depends on C2. Okay, so that differentiation gives us these uh, gives us these terms down here according to the product rule. You have one where you differentiate E, keep this one where you differentiate uh, this and then you keep E. Then rearranging that algebraically we get to the result down here where we have 2C1 times H11 minus ES11 plus 2C2 H12 minus ES12 and then divided by some denominator equals zero. But when we have this denominator here the denominator really doesn't matter as long as it's not equal to zero. What matters is whenever the numerator equals zero, then this is going to equal zero here. So what we need is our numerator to equal zero. You see in both of these terms here, our numerator has a two. <clears throat> so we can factor that out and divide by two. What we're left with is that C1 times H11 minus ES11, where E is just the energy, remind ourselves, plus C2 H12 minus E S12 and all of that is going to be equal to zero. Then if you went back and differentiated this expression with respect to C2, what you'd see is the equation that I have below here in terms of the different elements in terms of uh, these H and S integrals. And the set of these equations here can be rewritten in terms of a matrix notation. They have this matrix of the h integrals times the c vector of these variational parameters equals the energy times this matrix of overlap integrals times uh, the, the vector of those variational parameters again. And if you use the principles of linear algebra, multiply out what these matrices give you, the two equations they give you, you'll see that this is indeed the case. We can also uh, multiply through by E for this S matrix, then subtract, uh, then subtract E times this S matrix from both sides and get this equation down here, uh, which is the directly kind of the uh, matrix form of these two equations here, which is that the H11 minus E S11 and then analogous matrix elements times the vector C1, C2 gives you the vector 0, 0. Now, in order to make this true, you could use C1 and C2 equals zero, but that would be a trivial case because then our wave function would just be zero because we'd have zero times something plus zero times something. And we don't want our wave function to be zero. We want our wave function to be non-zero. That would be a trivial solution. So to get the non-trivial solution 
to this equation here, what we have to have is that the determinant of this matrix here that I have has to be equal to zero. And whenever we have a case like this, this is called the secular determinant, this determinant here of the H minus ES elements. So if we define these matrices here, we'll define the H matrix whose elements are the H integrals. So the 1, 1 element of the H matrix is H11, as we defined up here. Similarly, we define the S matrix um, in terms of the S integrals, the overlap integrals. So we have a Hamiltonian matrix here, overlap matrix here, and we have a <clears throat> and we have a vector here which represents the coefficients in our wave function. Then the equation which we need to solve in order to get um, get the energy E is this secular determinant here, and this generalizes now to n dimensions. So if we had three or four or five or a hundred variational uh, parameters here, a hundred uh, functions here, if this big N was equal to a hundred, then we would just have 100 by 100 H and S matrices uh, in this secular determinant. So for the variational principle, this is just equivalent to solving this equation for the lowest possible value of E, and that's our approximation to the ground state wave function. And this is a somewhat of a statement of the Schrodinger equation in terms of matrices, is that the matrix H times the vector C equals the energy E times the overlap matrix S times, uh, again, our coefficient, matri coefficient vector C, or HC equals ESC. Now, this may look a little bit different from the Schrodinger equation, H psi equals E psi, but we've been used to having uh, a set of eigenfunctions which are orthogonal to each other. And these, these basis functions were not necessarily orthogonal to each other. But if they are orthogonal, then the S matrix just becomes an identity matrix. And then what you have is HC equals EC. And this is the matrix analog of the Schrodinger equation of H psi equals E psi. Our, our Hamiltonian operator is represented as this matrix H. Our wave function is represented as a vector of these coefficients C and our energy just comes out the same. It comes out of whatever energy of the wave function vector we have there. So this is the linear variational method. We take some trial function which has uh, variational parameters and is a linear combination of a bunch of basis functions which form a basis set. And then we can solve the secular determinant for the energies and pick the lowest one and, and that will be our approximation to the ground state energy for our system within the approximation that the wave function can be represented in this basis set.